So, sorry, I have to like get the smile off my face so I don't look like a creep talking about this. <laughs> uh, so my name is Liz Eddy. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lantern. We do step-by-step -step guidance and support around end of life and death planning. So we're seed stage. Um, we've been live and out in the world since January of 2020, a really fascinating and bizarre time to launch an end of life and death planning business. Um, and we're about seven employees spread all over the US with two engineers in Africa. So every person on the planet will experience the death of themselves at some point and also the death of loved ones. And so we're one of the few businesses that truly impacts every human being. Uh, so the scale is really at the boundaries of who is on this planet. Building Lantern is sort of like macheteing the path as we walk it. There are, um, are like these you know, huge, massive conglomerates that we can look at and say, okay, this is, these are the steps they took and this is how they got there. So as long as we follow that pathway, we will get to you know, X scale by X time frame. Uh, for us, it's really uh, learning and trying things and testing and failing and pivoting, <laughs> which is true in any startup, but I think particularly when the space is really growing and developing and that we're, you know, combating a, a culture that has really had a lot of fear around talking about end of life and death. So um, I would say like more often than not, there are you know, stumbling blocks and learnings, but it's, it's I think the persistence of our team and, and our desire to solve this problem that has allowed us to, to really push forward. So I mean, overall as a learning, I think it's just having the expectation that that's completely normal <laughs> and, uh, and it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Of course, you don't want to make the same mistake over and over again, but you learn a lot from your errors as much as you do your successes. The life of a high growth founder is a roller coaster. I think that is probably what most people would say when they talk about the startup life in general. Um, and a roller coaster, not just from day to day or week to week, but from like minute to minute, hour to hour. Um, I think a lot of times you become a little bit addicted to it almost. It's, um, you get so used to the highs and lows and the experiences of it that I almost think about sometimes having a different job and, and how stability might seem very strange. <laughs> so uh, we definitely get used to those changes. But from day one, when we were developing Lantern, my co-founder and I said, you know, we want to put our whole heart and soul into this, but we don't want it to be our entire lives. Um, I think founders burn out when they don't give themselves the space for family, for friends, for sleep, for jogging, for whatever it is that makes them feel good and, and also allows them some distance from what they're working on. And so we've always had a pretty strict rule, which doesn't always get followed, but pretty strict rule that like vacation is vacation, take your evenings, take your weekends, and come back fresh and focused. And I find that when I do take my weekends and I do take my evenings and I do take vacation, that that's where all of the better ideas come from, where the clarity comes from, and also where like the pleasure in doing the job comes from. There's, there's a lot of pride that uh, I think founders in the past and also you know just companies as a whole have taken in saying like I worked late I worked a weekend I had to work over my vacation and to me I see that as an efficiency I'm like if if you have to do that we are doing something wrong and I tell our team that all the time like that's not a point of pride for us that's we have done something wrong to make you have to work that way and we need to figure out where the inefficiency is Um, I, I tend to take a positive spin on things. If you ask my fiance, you might give a different answer, but uh, I would say you know, the mental toll for a founder, I mean, it's different, obviously, depending on what you're working on, what kind of support systems you have. I, I think there's always a little like low level anxiety that like spikes throughout the experience because you're always thinking about how are we going to get to the next stage? How are we going to get to the next round? How are we going to get this pilot to turn into a paid contract? How are we going to get this customer to stay with us longer? There's always these 
unknowns and these questions and you have to be really, really comfortable with the unknown. Um, but it definitely does cause stress and anxiety. So I, I think for me, one of the biggest helps has been taking that space and also, you know, level setting with myself of like, yes, this is super important what we're doing, but if it doesn't work out, like I will be okay. We will be okay. Everyone will be okay. <laughs> and remembering that like, just we have to level set and, and remember kind of where we are in this, in the universe. <laughs> um, and, and you know, the scale of the things going on around us, especially, I mean, we've been building this company amidst, you know, so many different levels of, of stress and chaos and pain and suffering that we've experienced some of it. We've been, you know, watching some of it and not experiencing it directly. It really just depends on what's going on. But um, it's just very important to remember that, like, this isn't the only thing happening in the universe. Um, and then having a co-founder makes a big difference, too. Uh, I, I wish my co-founder was here with me right now, but she's... Um, She's truly the person that has made this whole process just a pleasure to do because we go through it together, we talk it out together. I have, I'm so impressed by people that can do it on their own. Um, I am not that person. I, I really deeply value partnership, and um, and yeah, she's made the whole thing just much easier in so many levels. <laughs>I definitely think, you know, when, when things are hard, that can certainly, like, that mood and that feeling can spread into, you know, other parts of your life. Uh, my fiance is very good at, at understanding that and being really supportive of it and, and also recognizing that I do try really hard to turn off from work when I'm not working. And, and that's, that isn't always possible. Like sometimes there are just things going on that go on late and I'm checking my phone repeatedly and I have to jump on my computer to do something. And he's very understanding of that because he knows that I wouldn't be doing it unless I really needed to. Um, it's not something that happens every single day. And so I, I think that really helps with relationships. Like I, I certainly know a lot of people that their partner is very frustrated by how much they work and, and how focused they are on work and proud of them, but also frustrated by it. And I think it's because you have to, in order to maintain any kind of relationship, you have to show that you're making effort to sustain it. And if you are fully and completely focused on something else, it's going to suffer. And so that's, I've always prioritized that and prioritized my friendships, my family. Um, they're the ones that will, will always be around and <laughs> the ones that, uh, that also make me a better founder and, and make me more supportive of my employees and recognizing that they also have lives and have things that are equally, if not more important <laughs> than what they're doing at work. Um, and we can't expect anybody to say, you know, this job is everything and I don't care about anything else. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that. Like it's important to be well-rounded. It's important to have other passions and hobbies and, and people to talk to that aren't just the ones that you work with. Fundraising is hard. <laughs> like that is in the most simplest terms. Um, fundraising has been, I would say on, on the, the positive side of things, it is really inspiring and powerful to talk about your business, to see people become immersed and engaged in what you're talking about, to believe in what you're doing, to see the vision of the world that you see. That is in so inspiring. I walk out of most VC pitches being like, that was awesome. That was great. I loved it. It didn't, it doesn't matter if the yes or a no. It's not like Shark Tank. I think a lot of times, um, especially like my parents, they're like, is it like this? Does this happen? Is there, they must be so tough on you. And I'm like, no, it, it's not like that. It is generally speaking, a very welcoming environment where ideas are encouraged and innovation is encouraged and you're supported and questions are thoughtful. And, you know, it's not always the case, but for the most part it is. Um, I think the, the hard part is just like the sheer volume of conversations that need to happen and, and maintaining that energy when you're saying the same thing over and over again is really hard. Um, and so I try to change it up. I'll throw in like new tidbits, new stories, new things we learn so that I'm not just like saying a script over and over. Um, but I do get energy from in-person connections. So my last two raises were all virtual and that was very hard. It was really hard because I, I, um, I'm so deeply passionate about this topic and yes, you can get through it a little bit on screen, but 
being able to actually be in person and, and share stories. And like, I know personal stories about most VCs at this point, because when I talk about my experience with loss and, and my inspiration for beginning this company and, and our team's experience with loss and why they were drawn to this business, pretty much everyone has a story and they feel compelled to share it. And that's really powerful. But when you're on Zoom and there's you know back to back to back meetings, you kind of lose a lot of that connection. So it became really difficult. The wrong strategy I found in fundraising is, um, well, there's a couple of things that I found that, that can be troublesome. So one is making sure that who you're speaking to when you're fundraising has lead potential first. I did not know that through my first raise. Our second raise, I was starting to figure it out, but no one ever directly told me that. It was never like, a if you don't have a lead out of the gate, it's gonna be very hard. I always was just like, try to get as much funding as possible and like the lead will come <laughs> through those conversations. That was always my assumption. I have since learned that you can in fact raise a lot of money and if you don't have a lead at the end of it, that money is useless. And we learned that the hard way and I've heard from founders over and over again since I've started sharing about that experience that uh, they've all experienced it too and had to learn the hard way that they had to reverse all their systems. I think it becomes even more challenging because VCs are not clear about whether or not they lead. Some will put on their website, like we write lead checks, we co-lead, we don't lead, which is so helpful to just have those lines of communication to say, okay, I'll go to this you know, non-leading uh, venture fund, but I'm gonna wait until I have a lead so that they know exactly what's going on and what the terms are. But you get a lot of like wishy-washy responses of like, we don't lead, but sometimes we lead. We've, lead, we've led before, but we don't lead now, or we would under these conditions. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it can get very hazy and confusing in the process. Um, and yeah, and then I would also say is just you're know, not assuming that everybody fully um, gets why you're doing what you're doing. You have you have to paint that picture. Uh, I think for me with like end of life and death, it initially sort of seemed like yeah, of course everyone would understand why this is important. Like it's it's one of the biggest and most critical parts of life. Like it should be very very clear. But from a venture perspective, it's not just about, is this a clear problem? It's also how big can it get? How much money can it make? And so I, I initially started in a nonprofit background. So for me, it was all about mission. I was like, if you do something right and you do it well, the money will come. But I didn't always paint that picture so well of how the money comes. And so over time, I've been able to do a much better job of that. But I think in the beginning, I was like, people just understand the mission <laughs> and, and they'll get why we do this. Um, so it's, it's, it was a little bit of a learning curve there. Yeah, there's seven of us. We got very lucky in the beginning. Um, my co-founder and I are like co-founder soulmates. Um, we met almost, I guess now about 10 years ago, uh, maybe even more than that. <laughs> uh, in my first job out of college, I was a, an executive assistant uh, working at a nonprofit and um, she was always the person that I would share ideas with. She would share ideas with me. Um, we both had a very entrepreneurial spirit, but very uh, different ways of thinking about things and doing things. It was extremely complimentary. And we always recognize that about each other. She's, we say she's like all things internal, all things external. I'm all things external. Uh, we actually have a tattoo <laughs> that we both have that's a kite and string. Um, and basically she's extremely grounded. She's a string and I'm like the big ideas person. So she, she holds me down <laughs> and I, and I keep her exploring. So, um, it's, it's always just been a really great relationship and we, she's a person, if I've ever thought of anything, I text her first. Um, she'll, you know, email me, look at this. Have you thought about this? Uh, we bought so many domain names over the years <laughs> and, um, it was really just with Lantern that, it not only was like, oh, this is a good idea, but we're, we're really the right people to do this. It's the right timing. Um, we have a very clear and unique vision for how we want to build this product. And so we went full force into it. And just through conversations with other people, I've, I've always been a really firm believer that you should share your ideas. Um, I don't believe in stealth mode unless you have like something super proprietary, <laughs> but like generally speaking, if you're just like, you know, a, a, your standard tech company, it's not anyone can build pretty much anything at this point. It's about how you do it. That's like the secret sauce.
So legacy is a, a pretty like meta question for us because it's literally what we do and it's also what we're building as a business. So um, I lost my dad when I was young um, and have always been very profoundly aware of the impacts of a death loss on your finances, your you know, legal situation, your logistical situation, your family, uh, your emotions, how you grow up. Like there are so many different elements um, that impact your life. And that was always something I've carried through since I was nine years old. Um, just very hyper aware of the importance of time, about how limited it is, about how important it is to spend that time with the people that you love and care about most. And that's exactly what pre-planning does, is it helps you create your own legacy, it helps you to reflect on your own life, to think about how you want to spend the time you have remaining. Uh, there's actually a lot of research about how contemplating your mortality and planning for your end of life makes you a happier person. You spend your time better. You are kinder to your loved ones because you, you recognize that it's limited. This isn't, you know, we don't have endless opportunity to do things we want to do. It's, it's today, like you have right now and that's all you have. And so as a business, that is so much of what we think about is how do we help people to leave the legacy they want to leave behind and um, and make sure that, you know, for me as an example, like it's not just a legal document. A will is important and it's great and it's a piece of your, your end of life planning process, but there's so much more that goes into leaving behind a legacy and that is sharing your memories and your stories, making sure there's not logistical chaos left behind when you die, making sure there's not debt or bankruptcy after you die, which is very common, uh, making sure that your, um, your loved ones know how to answer really tough questions. Um, a lot of times families completely fall apart and go into fights because they don't know how the, if the person wanted to be buried or cremated or if they wanted to be on life support or if they wanted a memorial service at all or if they wanted that really expensive coffin or they were like that's ridiculous don't spend a dime on it like there are so many questions that come up that completely break apart families because they just don't have the answers and so as a, a business as a whole our dream, our mission, our goal is to get every person over the age of 18 to create an end of life plan. Um, you should do it early, you should do it often. Um, it is so much easier to plan for your end of life when you don't think you're going to die. It is the worst time to plan when you have a diagnosis, when you're on, uh, you know, in hospice care. It's also not necessarily legally binding if you are in that kind of a state. Um, and it's awful for your family to bring it up so they won't. Um, and that's why end of life planning often doesn't happen. Yeah, well, lantern.co.co is our website. Um, so you can find all the information there. Uh, we're also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, handle is follow lantern.